the book of Colossians, you just need to remember one word. And that word is superior. That the word of God is superior in every way. A man called Epaphras, he was a pastor at the church in Colossae. He went to the Apostle Paul, and Apostle Paul was imprisoned, and told Paul there is a group of people who are teaching my congregation in our town that Jesus is not enough. And this is affecting us in amazing ways. And Paul reacted very strongly, like, like a man deciding to take a submachine gun and shoot at a mosquito. Uh, because what seemed to be so small actually appears to be quite huge. And it doesn't hit you until you start to read the book. So an outline of this book is like this. In chapter 1, Paul wanted to remind the people of Colossae about the supremacy of Christ. That Jesus has no rival and he has no equal. He is not the size of an angel. We covered that last week. And then today, we are going to see, because of this sup supremacy of Christ, what should the gospel look like? Because the word of God is the expression of this supreme God. It is there to be obeyed to the letter, and there's no negotiation about it. Because as a result, these people were bringing around new teachings on top of what they had heard, that Jesus is not enough. Next week, we look at, as a result of having a supreme God, and then you have a supreme gospel. What should our relationships look like? That's what Paul covered. And we already covered the idea of being in a supreme community. We started with chapter 4. So if you're just checking in, we did chapter 4 first, okay? To just remind us of the power of our community. Wherever it is that you go in the world and you find born-again Christians there, you should be right at home. You should. If you are lonely, in God's kingdom, it will never be because it was God's fault. God has provided people around us to be able to surround us with fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters that are not your biological family, but because the family of God, then we get better quality because of it. And I'm so glad today we are talking about e-groups. When, if you had one line to summarize the prison epistle to the Colossians, it would be like this. It's like when theology wears clothes. What does that look like? Today, we come to chapter 2, a superior gospel. When something is superior, it has no rivals. It's in such a class of its own that it stands out amazingly. And that is God's supreme belief that he has given us a word. If you put it against anything else, the word of God shines. But I want to show you an example of something supreme, something to look at and marvel. There's a Kiswahili saying that says, Chema chajiuza, kibaya chaji tembeza. A good thing sells itself. You know, friends, nobody argues with supremacy. Sindio. <laughs> Nobody argues with excellence, man. When you see something like that, I've watched that video like 72 times. <laughs> when I'm feeling down and depressed, I, I turn on that video, and it just inspires me. They asked David Rudisha how he felt going into that stadium and how he felt about his competition. Do you see the guy from Botswana was doing like this? <laughs> Rudisha said, I didn't see him. He said, I was chasing to break my own record. I was running against my own potential. He didn't see anyone else in that stadium. It didn't matter whether you are all-time American champion. It didn't matter whether, whatever it is you are in your country. When you run against the Kenyans, be careful. <laughs> be very careful. You know, friends, God believes the same about the gospel. God doesn't mind competition. Paul was saying it didn't matter how many other people were preaching whatever gospel they have. Bring it on. What I have is supreme. And that is what Paul was telling the people at Colossae. What you have in front of you is better than anything you have ever seen. God has never designed his word to be added onto things to make it better. 
The Bible says in Psalms 12 verse 6, And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. There's not a word of God that he speaks that is an idle word. There's nothing in the Bible that God says that was a last minute thought. It's something that has been thought of for years and years and years for eternity. It is the word of God. And when it's applied the way it is, it works. So bring your competition. It would be like you, forget those guys in the stadium, running against Rudisha. Imagine what would happen to you in that stadium. That is the word of God. Could I just ask briefly before we continue, in as far as you know in this sanctuary, how many of you in as far as you know you're a born again Christian? Let me just see. In as far as you know, wow, a sea of hands are up. Wow. Shiko, when you're here, you're used to seeing people. You actually get used to it. All right? And how many of you in as far as you know, you love your country and you would like to participate in a change that makes our country better? Let me see your hand. Nearly every hand is up. Please take in a deep breath because you're going to need it for this service. <laughs> All right? It's important because we're going to talk about some pretty important things. Now, Paul immediately, we come to chapter 2, introduces the people of Colossae what is the gospel. What is the gospel? And he tells them this in verse 6. So then, just as you see, received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Paul was saying, it's not enough to say, I got saved in 1960, and since then I come to church and go home and do nothing else. It's not enough to say that. There is a life of being a Christian. There is an exercise of your spiritual disciplines. There is an involvement we have with God that continues to make us strong as we grow our faith together. God is not looking for church bench warmers and for people who like to be in a church uh, rota, and that's enough for them. So he articulates about five things. Number one, it's important to be born again. That's why the prayer of faith ushers you into the kingdom of God. But friends, there's something else. He says, continue to live your lives in him. And you do that by maintaining a daily prayer and quiet time with God reading his word. Please ask your neighbor for me. Be as honest as you can be. Do you maintain a daily quiet time of prayer? You need to be very honest. All right? It's important, friends. That is number two. Okay? If that person kept quiet, there are things there. <laughs> number three, he says, be rooted and built up in him. To be rooted and built up in him is, apart from being born again, and you maintain a daily time with God. Do you belong to a new group? Do you belong to a group of people who can surround you with love, with care, with concern? People you can meet with probably on a weekly basis or more. Who can share your life with you? Do you have that? All right? Again, ask your neighbor, do you belong to a new group? Please, if they don't, you need to sign up today. Please sign up today. Do you belong to an e-group. Number four, he says that we need to be strengthened in our faith as we were rooted and built up in him, and then to be strengthened in our faith as we were taught. After you've been born again, after you maintain a daily walk with God, friends, our spirit person is a lot like our physical person. You need to eat food daily. You need a healthy diet daily. You need to drink water daily. The same way as your spirit person needs daily intake of spiritual food. If you go one month without these daily uh, practices and disciplines, you actually begin to die. And you can look like you're very healthy on the outward, but spiritually you're dead or significantly malnourished. 
after you belong to a group that encourages you, as was being shared with us about grief share and divorce care, that this church runs so well, is there something that you can find, can your faith stand by itself? When you're at work or you're in the office when you're traveling, is there something you can take in when you're strengthened in your faith that can communicate Jesus as a standalone without anybody else? This is a process of growth, friends. And then finally he said, be overflowing with thankfulness. The fruit of being a born-again Christian connected with God is joy. Because joy is attractive. It is what everybody else wants. The highest testimony of being with Jesus is that in spite of the things you are facing, you could have lost a spouse, you could have lost a job. Life is hard, friends. Things are thick. But someone can somehow look at you and they are wondering what is it that keeps you smiling? How is it that you seem to have this energy inside of you and yet things are so thick around you? The secret is that Jesus is the strength of your heart, that the joy of the Lord is your strength. It is the highest Christian testimony. And it doesn't come simply because you said I accepted Christ in 1960 and I'm just expecting things to happen. There are spiritual disciplines to put in. There's an involvement with the body of Christ that you do. There's an intake of the word of God that you take every day. There's prayers that you pray. There's sharing that you do. It is called, in simple terms, discipleship. That's what it is. So Paul is saying it's not a simple thing. Don't just do that and go away. And if you don't have these disciplines, friends, there are certain dangers upon you. And we need to be able to talk about them today. So today, we come to the heart of the matter of why now Paul was writing concerning the Colossian heresy. The Colossian heresy has got two dangers about it. I'll mention it again, but let me mention it early. Number one, it seeks to elevate men and women above the word of God. That's what it does. And secondly, it seeks to weaken you as a Christian so that you become ineffective in the face of trial. So that's why Paul reacted so strongly to this seemingly small thing that was coming to this church. The Colossian heresy said that one needed something more than Jesus to be an effective Christian. As a result, people were turning to philosophers and to their traditions to feed their faith. They were freely visiting witch doctors and magicians and anything that could help this not-so-powerful Jesus, after all. They also turned to powerful men of God, men who were articulate as philosophers and who could articulate something to the place where it staggers your imagination. And these people had said, said some declarations about themselves, like saying... For example, Kenyans would know this, that I am the mightiest prophet and the only person who can allow you into heaven. They say audacious things like that so that they look like they're elevated above everyone else. They were so powerful, they needed security. They gave the impression that they sit on God's boardroom table and there are things they hear from God that nobody else can hear. You could listen to them for hours and not once will you hear them mentioning Christ. And when they do, it will appear that Christ exists to support their vision, not the other way around. So they appear like spiritual giants. And in that regard then, the image of Christ was diminished and theirs increased. Unfortunately, when such giants die, so do their organizations and their followers. Paul said this, see to it, in verse 8, three charges he gave them. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Friends, the issue is Christ. If someone cannot be submitted to Christ or where they talk and somehow bring Christ at the end to support an idea, be careful. Verse 16, he says, therefore, second warning, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things that were to come because the reality is in Christ. 
These people, what they did, and some of the people in Kenya, what they do, is that they bring up all the, the practices of the Old Testament. And they bring conditions on you, what you should eat, what you should wear. You come to church and you find a, a, a board about how women should dress. They even tell you how to sit on a border border for women, what to do. And they go into a lot of details about holidays and whatever. And there are more traditions and rules than there is the gospel. Paul said all those things in the Old Testament were not wrong, but they found culmination with Christ on the cross and they ended. Number three, he said, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. You see false humility when lifestyle and opulence does not match the word humility. Some of those ministers and some of you can accurately write a book called How I Achieved Humility in Three Days. <laughs> you know, if you can say that, you're probably not humble. False humility is the kind of pomp that you see, but there is an inability of this person to submit themselves to God. That they tell you some things that are extra biblical. They tell you, God told me this, and by the way, you won't even find it in the Bible because I received it as a special revelation from God. So in, essentially, it becomes spiritual manipulation, and you can be held captive by it. Judge everything by the word of God. It's the standard and it's supreme and it's not going to be written any more than you have with you. Anything outside of that, you need to walk away. Some of you have been victims of mighty men of God. And some of you are, are, are admirers of mighty men of God. You'll watch some of them on TV this afternoon after we finish this. <laughs> Please allow me to educate us a little. Pastors, teachers, Evangelists, prophets, reverends, bishops, etc. are not called to be mighty men of God. We are called to be ordinary men and women who serve a mighty God. That is what we are called to do. That's what we are called to do. It is where you apply the might that is the issue. The might is not on us. I promise you, people on this stage, makaratasi human beings, save for the grace of God. Ordinary kabisa. God is the extraordinary, and it is him that we come to honor and glorify. John said in John 3.30, he must increase, and I must decrease, when he saw Jesus coming to be baptized. The Colossian heresy is upon us more than you can begin to imagine. Let me tell you something, friends. The devil is not dumb. He's not dumb. You make a serious error if you think the devil is stupid. The Colossian heresy, please sit up and listen to me carefully. The Colossian heresy is designed to change your view about church, about how you see church. It's designed for that. The Colossian heresy creeps upon a church when believers begin to slacken in their spiritual disciplines and in doing so, you make an amazing error. The error that the church is a building or people who work in that building. Once the devil succeeds in telling you that lie, he has taken the attention away from you and planted in your mind that another person can be blamed when society begins to rot. That is no longer your responsibility. Because of the elevation of these men of God, they become the definition of church. These men who come to lead people astray are not there independently by themselves. There's an agency of the devil behind it. And that devil is not stupid. He takes attention from them, you elevate them to this status, and then they become the church. I'll tell you the truth. There are some of you here who believe that the church, your church is on Gong Road. Here, okay? And that the, the people of the church are the pastors. So when your society begins to rot, it is common for congregants to write to the church and ask them, what are you guys doing about the rot? They write to the church. It's extremely, extremely dangerous. It changes your view of the church. 
Here is what Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. And he, that is Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. When congregants no longer see themselves as the church, they see no reason to change the society they live in, neither do they see themselves as partners with government to build a society that God can live in. That's so important. Can I say it again? When congregants no longer see themselves as the church, they see no reason to change the society they live in, neither do they see themselves as partners with government to build a society where God can live. If you walk into a community like that, you find government rotting, corruption is everywhere, congregants call in and ask pastors, do something. And yet, you are the church. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12, Paul said, And he, Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers. Why? To equip the saints for works of ministry and to build up the body of Christ until we all reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God as we mature to the full measure of the stature of Christ. My job, Kabibi's job, Reverend Nick's job, Reverend Faith's job is we are trained to teach you to be believers so that you can be salt and light to a rotting world. So it's us who should be calling you and asking you, why is there so much corruption in government and you're there? <laughs> Not you calling us. We should be calling the church and saying, what's happening, guys? Things are bad and you're there. You see how dangerous that, that heresy is? It makes you powerless and ineffective. When the Colossian heresy is upon a church, you will find churches full of people but who have no authority to tackle the biggest issues facing their society, like injustice, poverty, and corruption. It's like having a form of godliness but lacking the power thereof. When Christ is diminished, all you have is a name and a look called Christianity, but nothing else. What does the Colossian heresy look like in Kenya? As of mid last year, Kenya had 310,000 officially registered churches. That is churches which are official with a registrar. That if you enter the registrar and looked at the numbers, by mid last year, there were 310,000 with a larger number still waiting to be registered. So averagely, Kenya could have something like 600,000 churches. If you divide that by 47 counties, it could be that each county has an average of 12,650 churches together. Uh, uh, man, uh, our country is serious about Christianity. <laughs> Kenya, 85% of all Kenyans subscribe themselves to the Christian faith. It doesn't, it's a generic uh, association because it is everything from Legio Maria to, uh, to Church of God to the church in Rongai called Penina, it's my turn, to Elijah Musambua, to, you know, your churches in Shags, to Pentecostal churches, to evangelical churches, the Catholic church, the generic term. In other words, all the people who say they are not Hindus, they are not Muslims, they are not Shintoists, they are not pagan, that is, in Kenya, that's just about 15%. Can you imagine? 65% of all Kenyans go to church every Sunday. 12% of Kenyans know their pastor personally. We are generally known as a Christian nation. Kenyan pastors and evangelists have a genuine desire to grow churches. In the next one year alone, if you just combine Mavuno Church and Nairobi Chapel, these two churches alone seek to plant over 100 churches by the end of next year alone. That's why the California guys are here. 
It's amazing how fast the church is growing in Kenya. It is crazy. Kenya has one of the fastest growing churches in the world. It's amazing. On the other hand, <laughs> Ebu helped me to appreciate whether maybe I'm biased. When you Google corruption, the name of Kenya shows up rapidly. Am I my computer alone? <laughs> Do you think that on corruption we are getting better or worse? All right. I wanted to hear by acclamation whether it is true. It appears to be getting worse. 17 years ago, when Daniel Arab Moy was leaving office, CNN reported this, and I quote, after 24 years at the helm of leadership, Mr. Moy lives behind a country riddled with corruption and scandal. His legacy, peace and poverty. We had reprieved for all of five minutes in December 2002 when the world referred to Kenyans as the most hopeful people in the whole world, following a democratic election in which the duo of Uhuru Kenyatta and Madividi considered defeat. That was the picture taken as soon as that election. Kibaki won by, uh, Kibaki won by I think 61%. It was amazing. And they considered defeat. That time, Kenya was the 20th most corrupt country in Africa that time when Kibaki was taking over. I have a report in front of me that was written on 27th of February 2016. This is three years ago. A report by Price uh, Waterhouse Coopers on Kenya's corruption. And the report three years ago said Kenya is the third most corrupt country in the world. This is according to a survey on prevalence of economic crimes released in Nairobi yesterday by audit firm Price Waterhouse Coopers. According to the survey, the findings come a day after President Uhuru Kenyatta said Kenyans were experts in stealing, whining, and perpetuating tribalism. The president said this while addressing Kenyans who live in Israel. Similar views were expressed by the then Chief Justice Willie Mutunga during a newspaper interview weeks before. The Chief Justice told Dutch newspaper NRC Handelsblad that Kenya had become a bandit economy where corruption pervaded all levels of society. More worrying from the survey is the declining confidence in their ability to, for law enforcers to deal with these crimes. Said for PWC's forensic leader in Eastern Africa, Muniu Toiti. We are a country with a split personality. You know, recently on the road, I, I don't know whether it's just me, but have you been observing that the police have recently poured out these good-looking female cops on the road? Yeah. I, I thought, wow, the police is, uh, is seeking to, to improve its image. You know, you know, and when men are caught in scandals and you see them bringing their wives, you are seeking to improve your image, right? Because it is expected that if your wife is there, you are telling the truth. Somehow. You know, I have been harassed more by those female cops than the men. I, I thought they were coming to improve. They are even worse. I was stopped uh, somewhere on Mombasa Road, and this lady leaned into my car, and she asked me for money direct. I couldn't relate her good looks to what she was telling me. <laughs> I was so troubled. Friends, something is happening to, to our country. I asked a policeman, friend of mine, what's going on? Why are there so many female cops on the road? And he told me, life is harsh. <laughs> life is harsh. You know, friends, if this trend keeps on going like that, churches in Kenya are growing so fast, and our corruption index is going so bad. If you are to draw two graphs, one, where the churches are growing very fast and the graph is going up. And another one where corruption is going so bad and the graph is coming down. One day those lines are going to cross. And at the point of where they cross, the report will say, every citizen in Kenya goes to church every Sunday and they are born again. And Kenya is the most corrupt country in the world. 
Ebu, tell me whether that does not sound very funny. What is going on? What kind of thing do you need to see then to see this kind of statistic? That we have grown our churches so much, we have reached everyone. And everyone then goes to church every Sunday. But also, we're the most corrupt country in the world. Somalia has been the most corrupt country in the world since 1995, 2nd January, when Siad Barre died. We're just two places from there. If you check then into Kenya, right now, with this kind of statistics, what are you likely to see? Number one, you will see leaders who lack shame. A population and a population that admires thieves and protects corrupt officials. You will hear a whole county saying, we know she's a thief, but she's our thief. Those are the kinds of things you will hear them saying. You will find a weak president surrounded by thieves and held ransom by powerful cartels and forsaken by a church that is supposed to govern with him and help him to fight corruption. Because all of us are pointing to him and saying, do something, and we're supposed to be helping him. You will find youth who believe that the quickest way to get rich is to become a politician. You will find a country where justice is a laughable word and where there is no guarantee that if a governor is implicated in the murder of a young university student, all he needs to do is get time and a powerful lawyer who will get him off. That's what you're going to find. You will find a church filled with singing believers who no longer connect their singing to the rot outside their doors. That's what you're going to find. What do you need to do? How do you help this greed? Because we have got to be able to explain this statistic, friends. We have to be able to explain it. There have to be words. There have to be someone you can see. I have to ask you, how do you help it? Because if there are so many Christians and there's so much corruption, so what is it that is happening? So, lest you think I'm attacking you, let me start with me. I, I feel there's something I need to share with you. Because we, we have to be able to explain this. And for what I'm about to share with you, I have apologized to my family for it. Last year, December, I had a, a minor accident. A matatu passed in front of me and crossed with my indicator light and part of the bumper on the right. My tires were a mess. In other words, my car was unroadworthy. But I've been driving that car for about two weeks or three weeks. And every time we meet the police, I, I would be my children in, in the car and I would tell them I was just hit last night. So I am here and I'm trying to, to fix it. But then I was stopped in Ongata Rongai, where our church is there. And the moment four policemen stopped us, I walked out of the car majestically. Let me tell you, I knew that nothing will happen to me today. You know why? Because the church in Ongata Rongai has got a very good relationship with the Ongata Rongai police station. Very good relationship. Some four years ago, we, were, we went to do an outreach in this church, in this, in this police station, and we cleaned it, and the police officer shared with us something. They told us that when women are in gender violent situations and children, they run to the police station. And because of that, we have nowhere to house them. So we need a shelter that can be made for them because they have to sleep in cells. So the church rose up and, 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 and got together, changad about half a million shillings. If you're not a Kenyan, to changa means to changa, okay. <laughs> so we got together about half a million shillings. And we built a very beautiful shelter. It's still there now. And, and when women now come and children in the night, they can sleep there. We put beds, we put new sheets, and we, we maintain the place. And then we took a big logo of the Ongata Rongai, Nairobi Chapel Ongata Rongai, and we put it there on that wall. Because of that, the OCS became my friend. He's a good born-again Christian, good man. So time after time, I just walk into that police station for nothing. Just walk in there, you know, to just go and greet my friend Joffrey, 
to just go share a cup of tea with him, and then I leave. Now, when you go somewhere to see the boss, when you are leaving the office and he's escorting you, officers salute you. They salute you because they know you. So we are there on the road, and this cop comes here to arrest me, and I can even tell this guy is new over here. So he comes here and he starts talking down to me about the car, how he needs to take me in. You know, even if it was hit yesterday, police stations don't close and all that thing. And he started to raise his voice and casually, just casually, I just asked him, so how is Geoffrey doing? <laughs> and those officers, you know, he was taken aback. He's like, Geoffrey Mugani Uyo? I said both his names. He said, oh, yes. I said, yes, yes, the oh, yes. You look like you are new in these parts, you know? And, and he buckled up, he buckled up and, 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 and stepped behind. In a few minutes, as he was trying to get me back to the conversion of the car, I brought up the safe haven shelter which we had made for you guys. And I told him, did you see the image on that uh, church? I said, I'm the pastor there. The OCS is my speed dial. He wouldn't arrest me because I know people. Like you know people. In a few minutes, my family and I were driving off without, driving, without discussing my car or without discussing the tires. Friends, you know what that is? It's called impunity. That is impunity. I have repented before God and I've told my family, I'm sorry. I will not do that again. You see, friends, that is how I help it. The law becomes irrelevant. The only thing important for you is that you know someone. And you are just like me because you have people on your phone. You can leave your house and go somewhere and know nothing will happen to you because you know someone. We even have a saying that in Kenya, it's important to know people. So you subvert the law. You make the police unable to do their jobs because you have the economic power to change their lives. The five, ten thousand you have in your pocket, a police officer can feed his family for two weeks on it. You break a, 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 a law, you commit a crime, but you can get away with it because of the money that middle class, born again Christians can afford. This is why we have this kind of statistic. And we do that on Saturday and we're in church on Sunday worshiping God. That's our country has this kind of statistic. We need to repent before God and say, God, we are sorry and we can't do this again. And Nairobi Chapel, if each and every one of you does that, our country will change. It will. I met an officer, a junior officer, used to be at Parkland's police station. He told me that he was going to arrest this man who had hit a little boy with his car on Waiyaki Way. And the boy was critically ill in hospital. And he was pursuing the case. His salary was 35,000 Kenya shillings. By the time you do all the deductions, he was going home with something like 26,000 Kenya shillings. He has a wife who doesn't work and children in school. He's busy pursuing the case, trying to do his job, and he's a born-again Christian. This family called him, and he said, because I go to church every Sunday, I used to work as an usher. And this man, who we go to the same church with, their family invited me into their home. And him and his two brothers gave me 600,000 shillings in cash to lose the file. He told me he took the money, but that is when he lost his faith because that little boy died. Justice was not served because of the things you and I can do. And you wonder why we lose 4,000 people on the road every year and we can't be able to shake off this vice because friends, because of our corruption, a curse is on us. Middle class people thrive on convenience. Anything that is convenient for you, that your money can solve, 5K is very small for you. It is huge for this officer. And the police one day are going to tell God, I was not able to do my job because powerful people tied my hands from doing it. You know, Kenyan cops will hardly ever arrest you for nothing. And it's usually because you've been arrested for something that you feel the need to get away. 
I was going to do a funeral on our day. And a cop jumped into my car because I jumped a red light. I was in a hurry. The cop jumped into my car and decided to direct me to the police station. I told him, if you take me to the police station, I am going to leave you in Langata to do the funeral and then I go to the police station. So you blackmail him. He said, Mimi Suyosi Kuzika. I told him, then take me there to do the funeral. But you see, guys, you've jumped a light. Why do we so easily subvert the law of the land, which Paul calls holy, righteous, and true? You do that, and you actually experience God's curse. Because you don't even care about the law of our land. Middle class people, we do that all the time. You know, friends, if your car is unroadworthy, don't drive it. Don't leave home knowing you're going to break the law because you know people. We're incurring curses on ourselves, friends. Don't use and take advantage of people on your speed dial. Just do the right thing. Guys, we may not know it, but we, you and I, have become the biggest liability to our nation at this moment. Our lack of reverence for Christ makes us complicit to corruption. No one fears us because of our toothlessness and we make Jesus look like a dwarf. Nairobi Chapel, let me remind you. Two years ago, I stood here on this platform, July 23rd, and I told you specifically by the call and anointing of God not to elect corrupt officials. We were approaching the election. Let me refresh your memory in case you've forgotten. It's because you tolerate corrupt leaders. The people who have lined up themselves for election on August the 8th are essentially a galaxy of suspects. Those are your luminaries. There's very few of them who has not either been in government for so long, you can't see anything concrete they've done, and they're telling you, this time, I'm going to do something different. There's none of them who has never been implicated in some form of land grabbing. Or some have grabbed land here, some have even grabbed land abroad, some have grabbed symmetry. They are the people who are seeking your vote. There are some of them who you know are involved in drugs. They've been jailed. They have court cases as long as my arm. Those cases are still pending. They are setting up themselves for election. And guess what? You will elect them. And you did elect them. Nairobi Chapel, you are slowly becoming a, a congregation that has got no capacity to view God's word as supreme and non-negotiable. What is happening to you? This is two years down the line, and you're still holding on to your tribal chiefs. Our country is worse now than it was just two years ago. Much worse. I've had some of these leaders that you hold as supreme, calling each other witches. Then they're calling each other drunkards. And then a few days later, they are shaking hands. What are you supposed to do with these supremos that you follow? You need to decide today in Nairobi Chapel whether it is going to be your tribal chiefs who are supreme or Jesus who is supreme. You have to decide today. Today before you leave this service. Because our country is going down because we are beholden to these men who say this, who say that, who take your emotions everywhere and then before you know it, they are shaking hands and they are laughing. There's an image I see of that handshake. I don't know whether we have it, media team. Is it there? That picture. You know, 
Friends, I, I think they are laughing at us. <laughs> Don't you feel it? I think they are laughing. They are saying, look, look at those idiots. <laughs> they do everything we say. We say, go this way, they'll go. We say, go this way, they'll go. We say, insult this one, they accept. We say, insult this one, they accept. Nairobi Chapel, gifted as you are, educated as you are, why do you let these men make such stupid fools of you? Why? I need to ask you, Kalenjin Nation, isn't it time to reconsider William? I'm asking you, Kalenjins. I'm asking you, Luos, isn't it time to reconsider Baba? I'm asking you, Kikuyus, isn't it time for you to consider the president? Don't worry about lawyers and cambas. We are, we are, we are. <laughs> no threat, I promise you. No, no threat. We, we are okay. Lawyers and cambas, this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. It's okay. No issues. We are fine. We are fine. It's just the three of you who feel like you have to get this seat. It is you who you are going to have to consider today who is supreme in your heart. Remember, the Colossian heresy that is in Kenya seeks to weaken you as a believer, so that you cannot see Christ as supreme. Jesus said you cannot serve both God and money. It's the same principle here. You can only have one supreme person in your heart. Secondly, it seeks to elevate people above God. So this thing is on us, and you need to make a decision. And so I want to ask you, as we close does the word of God have authority in your life? Do you think that you deserve for God to keep bringing servants of God to tell you the same thing over and over and over and over? Or if your ears have become too dull, you need to let God know. And so I'm going to ask you to consider, and I'm not expecting everyone to stand, but if you are saying, God, I have such a sense of letting you down. Our country is rotting because I'm here, I'm a born-again Christian, and I see the duty of saving our country as belonging to other people. I repent, God, I want to stand, and I want you to use me to change our nation because I am part of this rot, part of this corruption, and I'm deciding today that I am not doing that anymore. I want you to stand so that we can pray, if that's you. Friends, if you mean it, and I'm telling you the truth, this is the last time I'm offering this warning. And it's not me offering it. We are servants of God, bringing you the word of God, which cannot be bastardized. So please put your hand on your chest. And we are making a pledge to the Lord. We can't be pointing fingers. Our country is going down. These statistics are being said about us, and we are here. Let's just stop the impunity and go to God and tell him, God, we are sorry. Forgive us for this impunity and help us to be the kind of people you call us to be. Please lift your voice to the Lord and pray. Speak to Jesus as I'm speaking to Jesus. Make a pledge to him about you. We will not subvert the law that God has given us. Beloved Father, we come before you as Nairobi Chapel this afternoon. Forgive us for our insolence, for the way we have taken your word lightly. We are people who your word comes in through our left ear and it leaves through the right ear. We cannot be coming into your presence with the intention of not obeying you or listen to you. Forgive us for our impunity, for our arrogance before you, for not following the word which you have given us, the word that that is supreme, that cannot be disputed, that stands out against everything else. Father, consider everyone who's standing on their feet right now, who acknowledges one way or another that we are part of the corruption and rot that is our nation. Have mercy upon us, O oh God, this afternoon, beginning today. Help us to respond 
respect our laws. Help us to follow the rule of law. Help us to honor God, to honor our leaders, to be able to confront our leaders when they fail, but to be salt and light in our nation because it is us that you have called to be salt and light in this nation. Help our nation to change because we are here today. Transform our nation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, everybody said, God bless you. See you next week.